why don't you turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel? Is anybody surprised by that by any chance? No. <laughs> this actually is our, our last Sunday in the book of Daniel. And then we're going to jump off into some other fun stories of the Bible. Anybody ever heard of the end times before? How many of you think we're in the end times? Huh? It would seem so. Actually, the end times started on the day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago. We've been living in the end times, but I sure hear a lot of talk about the end times. Is this the end of the end? Is this the time where Jesus comes? Is he going to return shortly? And we know that um, the scripture says that he will return soon. But the problem is, is, does anybody know what the word soon means? We don't know. You know that Daniel has a lot to say about the end times. In fact, the last um, five chapters, chapter 8 through chapter 12, deal with a, a lot of the visions that Daniel saw. He saw a lot of crazy things he didn't understand. He saw pictures of animals. He saw horns growing out of certain animals' heads and horns growing out of horns. And, and honestly, as you read the scripture, Daniel himself was very... Um, uh, troubled by all that he was seeing because he didn't understand what was happening. In fact, at one point, Gabriel, the angel, shows up to give him an understanding of some of the stuff that he was seeing. Now, you have to realize, too, that Gabriel um, is one of the big three angels that we know of. Gabriel, Michael, anybody know the other one? Satan, Lucifer. He's one of the big three. It, obviously, Lucifer had a different... Uh, journey, so to speak. His has been on a downward spiral. It'll end there too. But Michael and Gabriel are, are, one of them is a warrior angel from my understanding, and Gabriel is the messenger angel. And he shows up to really help Daniel understand what he's seeing. A lot of what we read in this in these passages, again, as you read them, they can become very, very confusing. Again, trying to understand what the animals mean and what all these horns mean. Um, that hasn't changed. There's been people for um, centuries that have tried to discern what actually Daniel is trying to say. And the timeline, it all supposed to happen. But I do want to say this morning that I don't believe necessarily that Daniel um, was interested in a timeline. I think he was just trying to figure out what was happening. He wasn't trying to piece it all together and say, in 1941, this is going to happen, and in 1995, this will happen. I don't think that that was his concern. I think initially his concern was for his own nation. And many of the things that Daniel sees and understands actually has to do with the nation of Israel. And actually, some of it does spill over into, I believe, the church us today in our future. I want, to say, I want you to say this with me. God's word is reliable. Say it again. God's word is reliable. You see, most scholars, I shouldn't say most, many scholars have no idea what to do with Daniel. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I mean, it's easier for us to grab a hold of the giant statue and the fiery furnace and Daniel and the lion's den. Those, those stories are really pretty easy to grab a hold of and apply to our lives. But when it comes to the prophetic, when God speaks to Daniel in these mysterious um, symbols and, and um, dreams and visions, when it comes down to trying to understand them, um, it puts a little bit different of a, a, a spin on things. And when you look at Daniel through the eyes of the prophetic, and if, again, we have the luxury of looking backwards on history from Daniel's time to the present, when you look at the, the visions and the prophetic utterance of Daniel, Daniel is so incredibly accurate in describing the events of world history that scholars just have a very, very difficult time in understanding, or at least grabbing a hold and believing that Daniel could actually write in 600 B.C. 
Because Daniel writes in 600 B.C. stuff that's going to happen for the next 400 years. That doesn't normally happen, right? Do you know anybody, do you know anybody in your lifetime that's been able to predict world empires 400 years in advance? Not anybody jumping up and saying, hey, that's me, right? And that's the challenge for many scholars is that Daniel speaks of things that happened um, generations, hundreds of years after he wrote. And he was so accurate that a lot of scholars, even today, even Bible scholars, say that there's no way that Daniel could have written in 600 B.C. He had to write around 187 to 184 B.C. Because his insight was so accurate, they say there's just no way that he could see and write that down. And so there are literally scholars today that write Bible commentaries that say that there's no way that Daniel could have written in 600 B.C. They actually would rather believe that Daniel wrote in 184 to 187 B.C. during the time of the Maccabees. And that he would write his experience going on in that time when... Uh, the the nation of Israel was experiencing all kinds of stuff. In fact, I'm going to read a little bit of excerpts about what was going on there. They would rather believe that Daniel was writing from an experience and looking backwards than, than say that there is a God that actually is in control of world history. And that not only is this God in charge of world history, but he actually has the capabilities and the desire to reveal the mysteries to human beings. Do we believe that God is sovereign over all of history? Somebody say amen if you agree with that. Do we believe that God knows the empires and the emperors, the countries, the presidents? Do we believe that he knows in advance who they are? Do we? Do we believe that God has the capabilities and even the desire to speak to human beings, even in our day and age? Do we believe it's possible that God could give Daniel dreams and visions and words that could be interpreted through the angel Gabriel that would speak of hundreds, if not thousands of years later? Do we believe that? You see, you're in a, in not necessarily a a majority with that belief. There are some, again, that just don't know what to do with Daniel. In fact, if we would look at Daniel, we would see that he predicted some really um, accurate things. Daniel writing, I believe, in 600, around 600 B.C., accurately predicted that the Persian Empire would follow the Babylonian Empire. He speaks of that. He even uses the name. Gabriel actually shows up and tells him that's the name of the next empire in one of his dreams or visions. He also predicts that the Greek empire would follow that empire. The words using, uh, are used in Daniel's text or in his writing concerning the Greek emperor, many people believe today, in fact, are very convinced without a doubt that he, they, that he is actually speaking of Alexander the Great. Now, he doesn't use that person by name, but what he describes about the Greek emperor, really, in most people's minds, is Alexander the Great. Daniel even predicts, through a vision, that the Greek empire would be split into four parts. He uses some interesting things, horns. It talks about four parts or four horns growing out of this one horn. He even predicts the Roman Empire. And then he also um, predicts an emperor by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. He doesn't use his name directly, but we're going to talk about this guy because Daniel sees some very disturbing things that are going to happen to his people and to his nation. It's during the reign of this Antiochus Epiphanes that many scholars say, again, Daniel wrote between 168 and 164 B.C. 
But there's so much clear detail that many believe that it's impossible for him to predict the future. So therefore, they would land on the earlier date or the later date. But I believe that Daniel wrote in 600 BC and that God enabled him to see the future. And that future does have something to do with us as well. And we're going to get there in just a minute. I was um, reading a number of things this week. And again, um, a lot of folks question the, um, the accuracy of the Bible. Can I tell you this? That when it comes to um, scholars and disagreements, some would say that the Bible is inaccurate, it doesn't give detail, that certain, such and such events didn't happen. Can I just encourage you, when it comes to those types of details, to trust the Bible before you trust scholars? Over and over throughout history, they have said, oh, this didn't happen. And then somebody turns a stone over in some lost city someplace and finds a, a piece of fragment on stone or some sort of uh, text. And sure enough, what the Bible says is true. Do you know that they didn't believe that actually David was king? That he didn't have an empire? And sure enough, they found actual archaeological evidence that talks about David and his empire. There's some things in Daniel that they don't believe either, or they didn't believe. And I, I wanted to offer you four really pretty, um, pretty cool things. Again, I'm the archaeological nerd. Uh, I love all this, this stuff. I hope you'll bear with me. You like that kind of stuff? Well, let me tell you this. Why do I believe that Daniel wrote in 600 B.C., not in 168, is a couple of things. There's some really small things in the text that you would think, well, that's so insignificant. What does it matter? Well, it matters a lot when we're talking about the um, authenticity of, and, and is, is Daniel actually writing during the time. There are details in Daniel that are written down that only a first-hand witness or an insider would understand. Number one is this. In Jeremiah thirty-three nineteen. Jeremiah actually mentions an office that was under the Babylonian Empire. He was the chief eunuch. Now, I don't want to go into all what that is, but he was the chief eunuch. Jeremiah and Daniel were prophets at the same time. They were contemporaries. They may not have been around each other much. Jeremiah was older. Daniel went into captivity. And we know that whole story because we've been re reading Daniel. But Daniel uses this term one time as well. So both Jeremiah and Daniel used the term chief eunuch. Now you think, well, that's just an insignificant detail. Nobody, that really doesn't matter. Yeah, it does matter. Because if you're a writing in 168 to 164, you probably don't know that detail. That there was an officer in the Babylonian kingdom that served Nebuchadnezzar, that his title was chief eunuch. Now, there is a, a stone tablet that was re recently discovered. It's called Nebo Sarsicum. Isn't that a fun name for a tablet? And, you, and when, they, when scholars found this, this tablet, it sat around for a while and no one looked at it and what it said. But as they interpreted it and wrote down what this tablet actually said, it actually mentions this chief eunuch by name. So again, Daniel and Jeremiah both had information that somebody writing in 168 to 164 would not have had. And an external text that was a part of another nation writes the actual chief of the eunuch's name on this text, validating the very words that Daniel and Jeremiah said. He would not, if he had written in 164 to 68, known that title and understood what was going on in the kingdom. Simple, but actually validating the very words of Daniel. Number two, some parts of Daniel are written in Aramaic, which is very, very close to the Hebrew language. It's a Semitic language. The language that's used in Daniel is consistent with the Aramaic of the 6th century B.C. 
Scholars have looked at the language of the book of Daniel and compared it to other texts written in Aramaic from 600 B.C. And the language of Daniel that it's written in is exactly the same as the language that's written in 600 B.C. Now, you'd say, well, maybe he faked it. Maybe he figured out how to write language or write his text uh, with ancient Aramaic. It would be like somebody writing today a contemporary term paper for your, your class in college in King James English from 1611. Now, how many, how many of you speak 1611 English on a regular basis? How many of you even understand 1611 English sometimes? These and thous and thosest and all this, that's the stuff us, that nobody can figure out what they're trying to say us, right? That's the same understanding that somebody in a contemporary time would write in Aramaic 400 years old. Again, Daniel's language that he wrote is consistent with the Aramaic of 600 B.C., not 168 to 164. Does it make a difference? Yeah, it does. The internal evidence of the book of Daniel points that he wrote 600 B.C. Number three, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anybody heard of those? The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947, and they've been discovering all kinds of fragments and things with the Scripture and other um, materials that are commentaries that describe the life of um, the early Essenes that were living in that community called Qumran. One of the oldest fragments that was found in Qumran is, guess what book? Anybody want to just venture a guess? Oh, somebody gets the Cupid doll, Daniel. The texts that they discovered of the book of Daniel, again, are some of the oldest fragments ever found in Qumran. They date to 150 B.C. Okay, so I want you to do the math. If Daniel did write in 168 to 164 B.C., the text that he wrote ended up in Qumran less than 20 years later. Now, I want you to understand this. This is pre-printing press. When Daniel wrote, he would have written his book down on some papyrus or some sort of other uh, materials that he had. It would have had to have been copied and distributed and it would have also had to have been accepted by the public, especially the Hebrews, the Jews of the time, and not only copied and um, accepted, but transmitted all over Israel. And then this group of people would have had to venerate it and copy it themselves and see that text as sacred. Now, can I tell you this? that that process does not happen in 20 years or less. There is no way that Daniel wrote in 168 to 164 B.C., and that document, that fragment, ends up in Qumran less than 20 years later. It's impossible for that to happen, for Daniel to find that much acceptance, to be seen as a prophet of Israel, and his text to be venerated as a holy text that quickly. The last one is this. How many of you remember that story of handwriting on the wall? Right? Anybody remember the king that was in charge in Daniel? That what that happened? He had a fun name. Anybody remember his name? King Belteshazzar. Say that with me. Belteshazzar. Do you know that until recently, archaeologists, archaeologists didn't believe that Belteshazzar even existed? Nabonidus, King Nabonidus, was the actually, he was the last emperor of Babylon. All the historical records say that he was the last emperor of Babylon. And so when Daniel writes that King Belteshazzar was having the feast and using the articles of God's worship to worship foreign gods, and the handwriting on the wall comes, they read that section of scripture and say, that's not true, because Belteshazzar actually didn't exist. So they doubted Daniel because of the mention of King Belteshazzar, because 
No records of him have ever been found until recently. Say the word of God is trustworthy. They recently found a a text or a, a stone tablet that actually mentions King Belteshazzar by name. In fact, he, he was King Nabonidus' son. And even the Greeks who were the next empire failed to mention that ba- Belteshazzar actually was probably co-regent of Babylon. They just mentioned Nabonidus. So scholars said, no, this can't be true because Belteshazzar didn't exist. Now they have texts or uh, or inscriptions that talk about Belteshazzar, that he was the king when his dad was out to war or on vacation. He took over the reins of Babylon when his dad was out of the loop. They know that for sure. Now here's a little interesting detail. When kings give awards to people and they're the head of the the nation, what do they say when they want to give somebody a, a big reward? They say, I will make you what? the second in charge of kingdom. That's what they did with Joseph, right? Pharaoh did that to Joseph. Why? Because Pharaoh was number one in charge, and he made Joseph number two. In Daniel, when he is interpreting handwriting on the wall, he is with Belteshazzar, and Belteshazzar offers him what? Does he offer him the number one seed? No. Does he offer him the number two seed? No. No. What's he offer him? Number three. Why does he offer him number three, not number two? Because Belteshazzar is number two, because Nabonidus is number one, and he, he is offered the third place in the kingdom. Small detail? Absolutely. Say the word of God is reliable. So, I believe that Daniel wrote in 600 B.C. all the prophetic utterances, all the things that would happen in the future. He predicted nations. He predicted events. Some would even say that if you do the math right, looking backwards, that he actually predicted to the day the birth or at least the dedication of the Messiah. Somewhere in there. That's phenomenal. There is an individual that I wanted to talk about briefly this morning because I think it has a lot to do with the end times that we would talk about for our day. Daniel did speak of our time, at least potentially our time. Because we don't know what the, we don't know really when the end of the end is going to happen. But he did talk about a leader, this guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, in pretty um, horrific terms. It actually disturbed Daniel. This leader was to come and he was to wreak havoc. In Israel. In fact, the scripture says that he would stop the daily offerings, that he would desecrate the temple, and that he would brutally persecute the Jews. And that actually happened. In fact, that's why many scholars today believe that he wrote in 168 to 164 is because. He was so accurate in describing these events that they say he must have come from that time. But I believe again that Daniel was seeing into the future because God gave him insight, not only through his dreams, but an angelic visitation. So this person named Antiochus Epiphanes, his name he took on himself. Epiphanes um, means to, to be revealed. And he gave himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes, which means God revealed. He gave himself that name, God revealed. And he set himself up uh, 
in the place of worship. And I have an excerpt that I wanted to read uh, to give you an idea what kind of an individual this guy was. Antiochus banned Jewish religious practices on a scale that not even Darius or Darius scheming civil servants could never have imagined. He forbade Sabbath observance and, and the holding of annual cycle of Jewish festivals. And as Daniel had predicted, he stopped the daily sacrifice. This was a daily ceremony in which a whole animal was burnt as a symbol of Israel's single-minded devotion to God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Antiochus could not tolerate that, so he banned it. He then had pagan sacrifices made on the altar, which was an utter abomination to the Jews. Like Nebuchadnezzar and many others before and after him, Antiochus could not tolerate people who would not bow to him. He was determined to break their spirit. So not content with banning the sacrifices, he proceeded to ban the reading of the law of Moses and ordered all the copies of it to be collected and to be burned. He went further and banned even the observance of the laws of Moses on penalty of death. So you were an observer of the law of Moses, and you were caught observing that. You were put to death. In particular, he outlawed the Jewish practice of circumcision, even going to the extent of murdering Jewish babies who had been circumcised. This is what he did. He hung them around the necks of their mothers and then hurled them from the walls in Jerusalem. This frenzied anti-God madness reached its height on the 25th day of the month of Chislev, corresponding to our December, in the year 167 B.C. In a final act of supreme and studied blasphemy, Antiochus had the Jerusalem temple rededicated to the Greek Olympian god Zeus. Nothing like it had ever happened to the Jews before. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and Darius had defied God but they had never done anything like this. Antiochus' act was an entirely new category. For the Jews, it was an abomination upon abomination and came to be known as the abomination of desolation seen in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. So Daniel predicted that this leader would come. And according to his word, if you look at what happened between 168 and 164 B.C., Daniel's word was fulfilled. It happened just as Daniel said. But I want to fast forward because here's where we come into this whole picture. Jesus in Matthew 24 actually references Daniel. His disciples were wondering when the end would come. Jesus said some pretty pointed things about the end times. All these things would happen. There'd be wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of crazy things going on. And so his disciples point blank asked him, well, when is all this going to happen? And this is his response in Matthew 24, 15 through 21. So when you see... Standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. So Jesus himself refers to Daniel's prophecy. And if we want an idea of what that looks like, we can historically look at Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 to 164 BC and see what kind of leader he was. And know that Jesus is saying that there is coming a day sometime in the future, a leader that will do likewise. Spoken up through Daniel the prophet. Let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never be equaled again. So Jesus was talking about a time that would parallel 
Antiochus Epiphanes, but, but even be on steroids, if I could say that. Paul picks up the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed for destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So both Jesus and Paul take Daniel's prophetic utterance and throw it into the future. It was fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes, and both, I believe, Paul and Jesus say that there will be a day where it will be once again fulfilled. That there will be a coming world leader that will completely be a madman, and wreak havoc upon the Jewish people, and I believe the very saints of God. So what do we do with that? There's a lot of folks that want to do the math and play, um, try to make a road map, trying to make all kinds of charts that say this happens, then this happens, and I grew up in situations where I, um, I've seen all of those maps. I've seen all of those road maps for all the events. I've lived through, and I don't have a huge long life, but I've lived through numerous people that said, well, Jesus is returning on such and such a date. In fact, I've told you before, when I was a, a youth pastor in Southern California, my senior pastor had a gentleman that came to the church, and he wrote a book called... 87 or 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. He came in, spoke great things, everybody bought his book, and guess what happened? 88 came and went bye-bye, and Jesus hadn't returned. So he uh, was smart, and he actually corrected a few figures in his book and came out the next year with 89 reasons why God is coming back in 89. Needless to say, we didn't have him back after 89. I don't know why we had him back in, in that time after that one, but some of you remember not too long ago uh, uh, the owner of a radio station, a Christian radio station that basically was saying that Jesus was coming on a certain day. I mean, it was all over the news. I think he was based in the Bay Area someplace, all over the news. People were selling their homes getting liquidating their assets and saying, well, I'm or spending them all, going to Vegas and having a great old time, right, with all your money, because Jesus is coming back. And the day came and went, and we're still here. I've heard an increase of the timelines even in the last couple of years where people have said, this is the end, this is the, this is the end times. And I honestly shake my head and say, you're right, it is the end times. It has been for 2,000 years. Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 36, again, when Jesus has been asked about the end times, he says this, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Say that with me. No one knows. Not even the angels in heaven. Not the Son. Who is the Son, by the way? Jesus. But only the Father. I have a great time speculating and reading all that material just like you do. But honestly, no one knows when the end of the end is coming. I think that we will have signs of when that time comes. I think when this world leader pops up and starts exalting himself and there's a, a sacrifice on a temple, which, by the way, hasn't been rebuilt. I don't know how you have an abomination of desolation in the future and a world leader doing that when there is no temple built yet. Just food for thought. 
And again, I know that there are folks in this room that may even disagree with me about the view of that. You may think that it's all spelled out. I'm good with that. I, a lot of times, uh, I remember growing up, we would have all sorts of Bible studies and things on, did, is Jesus returning before the rapture or during the tribulation? I mean, not before the rapture, before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation. Anybody been a part of those dialogues? We used to say, pray for pre, prepare for post. And I always just said, I'm, I've got pan theology in this area. It'll all pan out in the end. I remember at Bible camp, a lot of times we'd do rapture practice. You know, we would, we would do things like that to get ready. That's how I got such big hops so I could play basketball is all the rapture practice. But I also remember a time um, when I was a teenager. I was probably in ninth grade and my mom um, pulled me into the living room. I, she may even be watching this morning from Boise, but she'll probably remember this conversation. She says, why are you so upset and so grumpy all the time? And I go, what are you talking about? She says, you're just a mess. You're a pain in the rear end. And we'd had a series of people that had come through our church and talked about the end times that Jesus was returning any day now. And I thought, man, I'm never going to drive a car. I'm never going to get married. I'm not. No, I'm not kidding. It was devastating. I thought, man, I'm gonna get, my life's going to be cut short. I'm not going to have any fun. As if heaven wasn't going to be fun enough. And I remember she was gracious to me and I said what's the point of going to school if Jesus is returning I don't need to do good in my homework or anything like that why why praise the Lord right and fortunately for me that didn't work she said you know what no one knows the day or the hour I think we have to live our lives that is as if Jesus is returning tomorrow but not in fear What do we know for sure about the end of the end? What do we know from Daniel in his prophetic utterance? What do we know about that that we can hang our hat on? What we can, we can put our, our trust and faith in? One is this. The Son of Man will come again. That's a guarantee. Not only in the Old Testament, in Daniel, but the New Testament declares that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will someday crack that sky. And those of us who have passed away and died will go to meet Jesus in the air. And those who are alive and remain will also be taken to be with him. Now, I don't know when that happens. But that is a guarantee that the Son of Man will come again. Can we be ready for that? The second thing I know for sure is that there will be a judgment day. It seems that the more we look around, it seems that evil is untethered that people that do works of evil get away with it all the time in fact if we look at Antiochus Epiphanes he did all that stuff too and God did nothing it looks like evil is running rampant it looks like evil people get away with things Not only will Jesus one day return again, but there is clear scriptural evidence that there will be a judgment and that evil will be judged. In fact, the scripture says that those that are in Christ will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. will stand before Jesus himself. We'll be asked what we did with Jesus. 
and rewarded for what we did do with the life that he gave us. And those that are outside, those have not, who have not received Christ, will stand before the great white throne judgment. And God will part, separate, and they will experience eternal judgment. That is a reality. I think it's actually something that should shake all of us to a core that, that people that don't know Christ will stand before God and be judged. And will spend an eternity separated from God. We know that that is the case. And the third thing we know for sure is that the saints of God will receive the kingdom. And we will rule and reign with Christ Jesus. Think about that for a minute. When the kingdoms of this world has been, have, been, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ, we will rule and reign with him. But of that day and hour knoweth no one, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. My attitude in all of it is this. I'm going to live my life today in such a way that he is pleased with my life. That I live my life with no regrets. And when he does come, I'll hear that voice that says to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord that I have prepared for you. Anybody want to hear that? <laughs> if you don't, let's talk. <laughs> let's stand.